Well, good morning. It's fun to be back here. And um, I love that it's a smaller group that we can really hopefully interact. Um, I'm happy to have questions at any point while I'm talking. And I really want this to be something that's practical and helpful for all of you. So um, there's outlines on the table, if all of you got a chance to see that, if you want to take any notes along the way. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, this is my generational family. And kind of interestingly, I am there in the middle of the picture. We have four generations. My parents are 88 and 91. Um, I have five kids uh, with four in-laws, about to be five in February. Um, three, the, my kids are aged 25 to 39, with the in-laws included. I have three grandkids with my fourth to come in March. Um, they range all under the uh, age of five. So I get, I get this topic, um, and I think it's just a, it's a, one of my favorite authors uses the word brutal. It's brutal and beautiful at the same time. It's busy, it's complicated, it's challenging. I think as a parent, we often think, well, once I get through this early stage, then it'll be easier, and then it'll be easier. And, and I think having adult children is harder for me than having babies. It's just we're constantly in this process of learning and growing. And so I'm right there with you. And I hope today we can just talk about some ways to, some tips and tools to understand the generations that we're dealing with in our lives. And then some maybe practical ways that we can uh, practice showing up in the way that we want to in our families. Um, a little bit more about me. I got my bachelor's degree in child development and family relations. And so at that age, I really became just fascinated with the idea of human development and then had my kids and just loved this process of watching um, a baby become a person, you know, watching that identity evolve, watching that process from birth to death. And so that kind of stirred my interest. I talked about my family. Uh, we were here um, on Young Life staff for about 14 years in San Diego. And then at the age of 45, I decided to go back and get my master's and learn more about how I could help and empower people. I um, got my master's in marriage and family therapy. Then we moved to Doha, Qatar. Um, surprisingly, out of the blue, not where we thought we'd end up, but I was fortunate to have just finished my degree and so was able to have a private practice over there and had this wonderful experience with so many different cultures and religions and um, ages. It was just uh, invaluable to me, and I love that experience. Um, then came back and decided to keep on with my education, went to Fuller Seminary, got my doctorate in psychology and also a, a master's in intercultural studies along the way. And my doctoral dissertation, kind of as I was working in, in Doha, I kept kind of noticing this underlying issue as I would work with people, whether they came in for relational problems or anxiety, depression, there's always this kind of underlying sense of who am I and how do we get kind of lost along the way throughout our lives. And so that really stirred my interest in studying identity development. And so that's really kind of been my specialty throughout my work. Um, I do, a, I developed in my doctoral dissertation a curriculum because I feel like we all kind of know we're supposed to figure out who we are, and yet we don't really have much help along the way. And so the curriculum I developed and some retreats I do is just kind of creating a, an environment to cultivate that sense of who am I and how do I become myself. And then started a private practice. Well, I also um, worked at uh, Pepperdine University in their counseling center with their uh, athletes. I worked at Donovan Men's Prison. You, well, you're welcome to come on in. That's okay. Um, so I worked at, a, at Donovan's a men, a Men's Maximum Security Prison. And so even within that spectrum of society, saw this really fascinating view of development, of how do we become ourselves. And so that also has really informed my work. I work with um, veterans as well. 
So today, I want to just give us an overview of where we're going to go. The first session, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the ages and stages of life. Um, kind of being able to understand what are some of those critical things that we're working through in each stage. And so as we think about our families, our kids, or our older parents, um, how do we understand a little bit more about the unique challenges and growth opportunities that are in each of those stages? We'll have a break, and then we'll come back, and we'll talk about, excuse me, how do we cultivate connection? Um, come on in. Um, and kind of looking at the drama, like why is it hard to, to, for connection? Why do relationships so often have this inherent challenge and struggle? And we all know we love and want to have these healthy relationships, and why is it so difficult? And so we'll look at some of the common things that... Um, get in the way of our relationships. And then after lunch, we'll come back and talk about um, some really practical tools about how do we engage in conversation with, with others in a way that really creates the space to have healthy, safe communication in our relationships. Okay? And I'll try to have, there'll be a time um, at the end, I'll Leave a little bit of time at the end for specific questions, but again, like I said, if there's something as I'm going along, I know it, it can, might feel like a lot of information, and I don't want it to kind of just overwhelm you, so if there's anything I say that doesn't quite make sense or you want me to elaborate, please feel free to just raise your hand or interrupt, and, and I'll we'll answer, ask and answer questions along the way as well. All right, so when we look at the ages and stages of life, I talked about this kind of brutal tension between brutal and beautiful, and, and that so often we're kind of holding two things at once. And so one of my favorite uh, psychologists as I went through my training was Eric Erickson, and I think he has one of the most um, kind of practical theories on the stages of development from birth until death. And within each stage, he talks about this kind of tension that we go through. His wife was also a really central part of the work that he did. So he was, um, you can see he lived until 1994, but in the 50s is when he kind of put out his theory. And he was a student of Freud, so was influenced by him. But yet what he, whereas Freud talks so much about kind of the psychosexual development, Erickson really felt like it's more than that. It's, it's a, a biopsychosocial. So he really saw that it is our biology. It's the way that we're made. But it's also the psychology about it. How do we interpret the world? And then the social part is how does our world impact us? And so this really multi-faceted um, way of becoming a human being is what he really wanted to focus on. And so he developed eight stages from birth to death. Um, what's interesting is that five out of those eight happen before adolescence. So we kind of see how crucial those early years are in, in our development. And then he talked about at each stage, you'll see we'll, we'll go through it a little bit um, more in a minute, but at each stage there's kind of this tension that we're trying to sort out. And as we sort it in a healthy way, we kind of move on to the next stage and when we don't, we kind of end up with some, some stumbles along the way. And so even though each stage has kind of its critical issue that is kind of most, um, most salient at that age, it's this ongoing process of development. So it doesn't feel like, oh, we missed it at three to five years, we're, we're doomed. You know, we're constantly able to kind of continue to cultivate growth when given the right conditions. And I think that's, we think about anything that's going to grow. When it has the right conditions, it's going to thrive. When it doesn't, it's going to stagnate. Um, yeah, and so that, just that idea that we're, we're never too old to keep growing. And I think as we watch people who age gracefully and well, I think that's a key part, is this idea that they can, we can constantly learn and grow. We may have thought a certain thing our whole lives and something has happened to change it and we can say, hmm, yeah, maybe I, maybe I think differently about that now. And that's okay. That flexibility, that ability to continue taking the new information and allow it to change us is, I think, what makes our aging process most healthy. 
And so this is just kind of a, a quick overview, and we're not going to talk about the early ones, just because we're going to focus more on the, the later part, but just to kind of do a brief mention of them. So infancy, um, the, the tension is trust versus mistrust. The baby comes out kind of wondering, can I trust my world? Like, d- if I cry, does somebody take care of me, is their central question. Early childhood, when they're starting to potty train, become more independent, it's can I be autonomous? Can I start to do things on my, on my own? Can I feel proud of that? Or am I shamed for that, which creates some self-doubt? Preschool, they're beginning to do even more, and it's this, they're trying to live out different roles, they're trying to help in the kitchen and do different things, and it's like, is my initiative met with, with reward, or is it met with, met with, you shouldn't do that, you messed that up, you know, kind of that... Uh, added to guilt. Somehow I can't do what I'm trying to do. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail from school age on, and so I'll move into that. And so these ages, um, Erickson, it, he, he didn't really give ages to him because it's not about age, it's more the developmental process, but about these ages of 6 to 12 is the school age, and the tension at this age is industry versus inferiority. And so this is when, and so as I'm talking about these, some of you may have grandkids or people in your life that you, that you know and think about who are in these ages, but I also want to challenge you to think about your own growth. It may have been a long time since we thought about when we were just starting school, when we were in first grade. And so I think it's, it's helpful sometimes to just be able to reflect, what was that like as I became a student in school? What, what changes so often is that before when the family is their central social setting, they move into school and all of a sudden there's a bunch of other people. And so how do I measure up? Am I as smart as that person? Am I as good of an athlete as that person? Do I look the same way that person looks? And so this is where this idea, when they, when they uh, kind of go through the stage in a positive way, they develop this sense of competence. Like, I'm okay. If they don't, they begin to be inhibited. What's wrong with me? Somehow I'm not I'm not as good as everyone else. I'm not as smart. And they begin to grow uh, some lower self-esteem and lack some confidence, some feelings of inferiority that might start to develop here. And so in each age, we'll kind of look at what the key question is. And so for this, this stage, key question is, do I have what it takes? Am I enough? And I think what's so profound about this question is, I think when I sit with people in my clinical practice, am I enough is still such a pervasive question as an adult. And I think it, it stems from that, those, early, those early times of comparing ourselves. And I think especially when we think about um, the world that our, this generation is growing up in, when we were growing up, we just kind of looked beside ourselves, you know, looked in our kind of sphere and could compare. And now with social media, I mean, kids are comparing themselves across so many people with so many different, you know, abilities and gifts that they're putting out there. And, you know, in school age, the big challenge is, you know, am I going to be invited to the, to the party? When we were growing up, we maybe didn't know if we were invited or not now. It's posted on, you know, so they know not only was I not there, but who was there and how much fun they had. And... So you just see how when there's already this vulnerability to am I enough, and then they're kind of bombarded with this constant comparison, it really becomes a challenge. And so hopefully, when they kind of can navigate this, they end up with a sense that I'm enough, I can learn to manage myself, my behavior, and my emotions. The negative or maladaptive message is somehow I'm just not good enough, not strong enough, not pretty enough not smart enough, wherever their kind of sphere of influence is, they begin to kind of develop this self-doubt. So then adolescence, and then you kind of see at each stage how you kind of take where you were into the next stage. And so for adolescence, the big uh, tension is their identity. Who am I? And often um, teenagers, this is when now even more their, their peer group becomes their main influence. And they're really kind of trying to figure out who they are by looking at who others are. And the more they're looking at others rather than 
um, rather than kind of looking internally to, to listen to themselves and kind of learn from themselves, who am I? What do I value? What do I want in my life? Rather than kind of going to their peer group to answer those questions for them. And so their key question, who am I and who can I become? The hope is that they come to this place. And when we keep, I think, with people in that age group, we keep trying to turn them back to, what do you think? How do you feel? What do you want? Letting them become focused on my first question is to myself, not to all those around me. And then they can learn to, I can accept myself. I can express myself. I think this is the other thing for an adolescent, the ability to express themselves. Because a lot of times they're trying it on. They're trying different ways of expressing. They might wear different clothes, do their hair a different way, practice different beliefs. And when that's met with, oh, well, no, you can't be that. You shouldn't do that. That's not okay. They begin this role confusion because part of their insides are saying, this is what feels right for me, but the world is telling me no, so therefore I guess I can't trust myself. And then we begin this kind of um, distressing kind of internal battle in people. Um, and then I think also all re- that, again, the idea that I have the potential to grow and change. I think at every stage, that deep awareness that says, I am constantly in process. I don't have to be, I'm not finished. I'm always learning and growing. The maladaptive message, when they keep getting these um, messages from the outside, well, that's not okay, or that's, we don't do it that way. They begin to decide that I must hide myself and pretend um, or I'll find my identity in some, something or somewhere else. And this was really interesting when I was over in, in Qatar, as I would work with young people who in it, it, Qatar is a very conservative country still, where all the local women wear the abayas and the head covering and, and the, the kids as well. And so I worked with a lot of, um, especially the teenage girls, young women, who have to, have to match the culture that says, you must do this, you must do that, especially as a woman, certain traditions that were expected. And yet internally, and as again, they're watching the world around them thinking, but maybe I want to go to school. Maybe I want to go to the United States or Europe for school the way my brother can go. And maybe I don't want to wear this all the time. Maybe I want to wear my head scarf, scarf looser. And so they really began having this kind of dual identity that when they're in their family, they're one way, and when they're in school, they're somewhere else. And I think sometimes within the Christian culture, we see that as well. Kids have this really strong sense of this is the way I should act, and yet when it doesn't feel congruent or there is just some kind of internal sense that I want to try something else, they put on a different identity outside of the home. And so again, that begins to create this tension and confusion within them. Well, who am I really? Am I, how do I really even trust and know my own voice? Because the other voices are so loud that are coming at them. So then the next stage is young adulthood. Oh, I didn't mention with the one thing about uh, the age ranges here. When Erickson was doing his work in the 50s, adolescence kind of stopped at 18. And nowadays, it really, it's kind of, there's an idea of emerging adulthood where it really goes up to maybe even 25, even 30, with more people going to college, not just stopping with an undergrad, but more people going on and, and getting graduate degrees or doing traveling and gap years. And so it is, and I think it can be frustrating sometimes for the older generation to think, well, why don't they become more responsible? Why aren't they taking care of things, getting married, getting a job? And yet, that's, that's their culture, and that's in a lot of ways, a healthy process. I think sometimes they look at the older generation and think, well, they just worked in that company forever, or they did this forever, and that's not what they want. They want to explore. They want to kind of figure out what really makes sense for me. And that's a healthy process, even though it can be frustrating sometimes, I think, for us to watch. And I think it's hard. I know my son struggled for a while, and he hated that question, what are you going to do? And I had to be so careful. I was just curious, but every time I asked it, it created this anxiety within him because he didn't know. And so I think the more that we're aware of that internal anxiety, they want to figure it out. And the more people are asking, often it kind of may create that need to, well, I'll just do this, you know, to, to make everybody happy and quiet. So the thing about um, this next stage in young adulthood 
uh, Erickson identified the, the, the tension here is between intimacy and isolation. And this is the age where people are trying to find that significant other. And what often happens, and I see this so much in my practice, is that people struggle to find out who they are. And so they decide, well, I'll find out who loves me. And if I can find out who loves me, then I'll have a sense of worth and I'll have a sense of knowing who I am. But in that, their identity becomes meshed with whoever their person of choice wants them to be. And so these get flipped. And so often I work with people in their mid to later life who are finally kind of stopping to say, I don't know who I am. I I don't think I ever figured it out. I, I got married. I had kids. I did my job. And I don't know now who I am. And I think that so often when this gets flipped, we form ourselves around somebody else trying to be loved and trying to belong rather than forming ourselves with a clear sense of who we are. And so in this stage, the hope is love. And I think it's not just uh, romantic relationships, but also significant friendships. It's, it's a stage of really trying to figure out how do I authentically open myself up to other people. And um, here, this kind of maladaptive outcome, the indiscriminate versus over-rejecting, it can be like, okay, well, I'll just get anyone to love me. I'll go out with anyone. I'll find anyone. I'll find, you know, the, someone to love me or put up the wall and says, I don't really want anyone anyway. Uh, it's easier not to. And, and that becomes a self-protective thing, becoming overly uh, picky or discriminate. And so these both extremes kind of get in the way of someone authentically finding out how to connect with someone. So here their key question is, am I lovable? And can I be my true self with another? The the adaptive belief is I'm worthy. I can know others and allow myself to be known. I can love others and allow myself to be loved. And this is a really important part too, because I think sometimes people can know, I'm going to ask people questions, I'm going to get to know them, but I'm not going to be able to be vulnerable myself. I'm not going to let somebody in. Or I can love and serve and give but I don't know how to receive love. And so it really is this balance between both knowing and being known, loving and being loved. And the maladaptive message is somehow I'm not worthy. I should therefore abandon myself and just become what other people want, finding their identity in someone or something else. And you see this with either a partner or or maybe their career choice, that my identity will be in what I achieve rather than in who I am. So then middle adulthood, which is, I think, where a lot of us are here, this stage is kind of where they're moving into parenthood work. And the the tension here is how do I give back to my world? How do I generate something of worth in my world through my kids, through my work? And the adaptive hope is this care for themselves and others. But the maladaptive outcome is this overextension. I will give and give and give, and I will spend myself doing my job or volunteering or giving to my family, or I'll pull back and I, and I can't do any more. And so again, so often we have these two extremes where we kind of tend towards, but rather than finding that, that balance and the tension between giving to others and also being able to care for ourselves. And so the key question, do I have anything to offer? And hopefully the belief is to figure out that I am someone of value and purpose and I can make a difference in my world. And I think here too, the healthy thing is I can make a difference in my family. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to be known, you know, and I think that's also a challenge for the younger generation because now so often they're an Instagram star and have a million followers and, you know, it's this big thing rather than how do I make a difference in my world, in my family, in my sphere of influence. And the maladaptive message is that I must be needed by others to have value. Or nobody appreciates me or what I do. We spend all our time giving and giving, and then somehow resent that I'm not, no one's appreciating what I'm giving. And yet sometimes pausing to ask is, are people asking for that? Or are you just giving and giving in an effort to be needed? And I think that um, so often that is what will kind of come up in later life when it feels like I've given and given and given, 
and I'm exhausted and spent and haven't figured out how do I take care of me? How do I give to myself? And I think what's so important too in this age when it is the busy age of young kids who are watching, realizing that the model of martyrdom isn't helpful for our kids anyway. You know, that idea like, well, my whole life is about you and I'll do and do and do and then somehow you owe me because of all I've done. And that's kind of teaching them a lesson that we don't really want them to know either. We want them to see this healthy balance of loving and caring for others and loving and caring for ourselves. And then older adulthood, kind of 65 years and older, and um, here's kind of where it's all starting to kind of integrate. This ego integrity versus despair is saying, have I been true to me? Have I figured out who I am and have I lived in a, well, uh, lived in a way that feels congruent with who I am? Have I gained, as I kind of reflect on life now, it's not so much out there giving and doing, but kind of a more limited, limited abilities maybe, limited uh, encounters with maybe retirement. And so a time to reflect on life and kind of these maladaptive, the, the positive is to gain wisdom. Like I've learned and loved and done well. The negative is this kind of idea of presumption. Well, nobody's doing it the way we did it. You know, it was better the way we did it or bitterness and regret as they reflect on things and and miss what they could have done, should have done, didn't do. And I think this is a, um, the beginning of a, a challenging stage in life because so often, if we can just keep busy, keep doing and doing and doing, we don't really pause to reflect. And it's interesting, as I work with veterans, um, there's so many who have PTSD that they've been struggling with their whole life and once they finally get to retirement age, it all comes crashing down. Or once they've been in the military for a long time and then they get out and their life slows down, then they've got to think about it all. And that's, that can be challenging for people who've had some things that have been difficult to think about. And so this stage of life um, requires some wisdom and some ability to be reflective and... Um, why you also see how it can be easy to move toward, well, everybody else is doing it wrong, or um, some bitterness that they reflect and feel um, some sense of regret about what they, what they have done in their life. And so that key question is, have I lived and loved well? And I think it's so important to note, this isn't have I lived and loved perfectly. And I think so often we rate ourselves on that, like, well, I wasn't always the best parent or the best employee or friend or whatever it might be, and yet none of us are. And so it really is, the, and I think with our kids too, cultivating this idea, it's am I doing well? Am I enough? Not am I perfect? And taking that kind of out of our, have I been authentic rather than am I perfect? And so hopefully the adaptive belief is to feel like I'm at peace with myself and my life. I have wisdom and love to share. And a maladaptive message is that feeling like it's too late. I failed, and somehow nobody cares about me. And that becomes the bitterness and the despair. And so what was interesting, when um, Erickson did his um, theory, he kind of ended with that stage. And then his wife, who lived beyond him and had been part of his work, she kind of named this ninth stage. And she didn't have a name for it. So my husband came up with this name, Sage Old Age. I didn't want to just say old age. It doesn't sound good, so I like this. And so it's this idea that, and it kind of starts anywhere, you know, again, the age isn't there, but I think so often people are living well beyond 65 years. You know, that still is a really more productive time for a lot of people than it may have been in the past. And so this is when you kind of are getting beyond into where you really are starting to to see more of the physical limitations that are happening, the, the process of aging becoming more um, prominent, I, I guess, in your life. And, and so um, she kind of named this tension as hope versus hopelessness. And I think that's such an important hope. Hope is one of the most protective factors against suicide. And the lack of hope is one of the biggest risk factors. And so I think... 
it's so important to kind of just see that um, the importance of hope, even at the ending, ending kind of stage of life, to still have this hope for something. And so when I think that's there, there's this ability to kind of um, reintegrate this, this stage. And I'll we'll kind of talk about more in a minute. But this is stage really where you're kind of going back and you're redoing all the other stages in a way that can be challenging. And I think this is really one of the most difficult stages of life for people. And so she named um, the adaptive strength just Jiro... I have a hard time saying this word, zero transcendence. And that's something a um, researcher uh, in Sweden, Tornström, kind of gave that. And so this idea of, of transcending kind of the boundaries that we're in, um, it's kind of regarded as what could be this natural process toward maturation and wisdom. And so what he did was he studied older adults age 52 to 97 and what he found in this interviewing process of those who were aging well was this sense or aging in a healthy way, this ability to kind of transcend borders and barriers that had previously kind of held them back. And that when people were able to kind of transcend that, it really became this healthy growth time for them. And so what he found was that people would identify they began to have a new understanding of themselves, a new understanding of others, and kind of some... Uh, fundamental uh, answers to those kind of existential questions that, um, that they had wrestled with through their life. And so I think this is so key, like I talked about earlier, that idea of constantly being able to learn and grow, to think about at your final stage of life, to be able to have a new understanding of yourself and others is just a really healthy, open curious way of living. And I think the ones who say, nope, this is the way it is, this is how I am, this is the way it's always been, they're the ones that their world begins to close in on them versus being able to open up for them. And so what this last stage, this idea of zero transcendence and revisiting, and I want to kind of spend a minute on this because I think often we don't recognize, and I know as we talked about this generation who, who are trying to help older parents Sometimes it's hard to talk to them. Sometimes it's hard to get them to do what we think that they should do. And yet I want us to really just kind of think about what this stage is feeling like for them and what, what are these um, internal processes that need to happen. And so, like I said, they're going back and they're revisiting and reintegrating all of what they have already gone through in their life in an opposite way. So the first one, infancy, when I told you the idea was trust versus mistrust, the baby wants to know, can I trust my parents to be there when I'm, when I'm crying, when I'm hungry, when I'm needy? So an old, older adult is saying, can I trust my kids are going to be there to take care of me? And also, can I trust the world? Like I, I did this um, talk at UCSD to an older group of people, and and for one of the women who asked the question, it was kind of was like, can we trust the next generation to do it? They're like, aren't they messing it up? Isn't everything falling apart? And I think in every generation, people have wondered that. And so part of this, this growth is to say, I can trust others to do. I can trust the next generation. I can trust my kids to help me in this aging process. But that's a hard thing because they've spent a lifetime being the one to be trusted, being the one to be looked up to and have the answers. And so to kind of have to revert in a way back to, I need to trust others to take care of me, that's a really difficult, it's a difficult transition to make. And then same here with early childhood, when I said it's the idea of their learning their autonomy. I can walk by myself, I can toilet by myself, all those things which create a big sense of pride and accomplishment. As people get older, they're beginning to say, I'm not autonomous. I can't walk by myself. I can't toilet by myself, you know, or I, things that are so uh, central to a sense of self, they're losing and they're having to kind of revisit and say, am I still okay even if I'm no longer autonomous? Can I still feel good about who I am? And then the preschool, when it's um, initiative versus uh, um, guilt, they're kind of that same idea, like, do I have an issue? Can I find something to do? 
Can I do something that feels worthy? I can't do my job anymore. Maybe I don't have some of the same physical capabilities of doing maybe hobbies and things I used to do. But how do I find something that allows me to build confidence in myself, to feel like I still have initiative in my world? And then again, this kind of school age where it's the comparison. How am I aging compared to others? Am I less competent than others? Am I able, you know, my friend is still driving and I can't. Or, you know, there's still, we're all through life. We're the, still the same vulnerable human spirit that says, am I enough? And this comparison goes on through life. And so they're, again, kind of having to revisit this in a challenging way. And then the adolescent, the identity piece is, again, as they're losing so many aspects of what they did, they have to focus on, well, then, who am I? It's not about what I do, but who I am. And for people who haven't really taken the time to, to shore up that sense of self, and it was about what they did and, and how they could produce, it's a different way of kind of finding identity based in this um, more internal process of who am I. And then this is a big one. Young adulthood, this, I, the stage in life where it's intimacy and connection and for this age group, they're losing significant relationships that they've spent years and years and years with, often 60 and more years with a spouse or friendships. And my, my mom had said to me as they got into the older ages that as they grew up with their friends, she said, I always knew we would go through you know, college together and weddings together and babies together and grandkids together. But I didn't think about dying. I didn't think about that all of a sudden now they're in this, and because they're healthy and living later in life, their friends are just dying every month, I feel like. There's, there's someone else. And so that's a really a deep grieving process, I think, um, for people to kind of go through. And, and the same need for connection and intimacy is there, and yet it's becoming, it feels like it's kind of falling through their fingers in a sense. They're kind of losing some of those significant ones. And some of their younger ones are busy. You know, we're kind of in that generation where we're busy with our kids. And it's hard to, to help kind of create those connections that are so important to our, our parents when we're also trying to be active and involved with the generation below us that needs us. Um, and then this one, just the middle adulthood, can I keep finding ways to, can you continue to give to my world, and I think this is where volunteer activities for older people can be so great to find um, just some way that they can feel like they're continuing to generate and to give to their world. And again, it's this older one of uh, the last stage of, can I feel at peace with myself and my life? And so this idea of zero transcendence, I think the question really becomes, can I be content whatever my circumstances? And I think when I think of that question, I immediately kind of go to Paul, thinking in Philippians, and I just love the way this verse, I think, answers that question, and especially I like the way it's written in the message, where he says, I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. And I just think that is such the central core, and I think especially for us as Christians, to know that, that it's, it's Christ who makes us who we are. The world and all that we do and the journey and the story that we have is, is part of the way we interact in the world, but the true source of our identity is knowing who we are in Christ. And I think the more that as we go through the process of aging and the journey of life that we hold that central, I think that really also fits in every single stage when that's the, the core of where we find our identity. Questions? I know that was probably felt like a lot. Um, any questions or thoughts as you kind of were reflecting on those ages for yourself or for people in your family? Uh-huh. 
Yeah, so she's asking back to... So middle adulthood, thanks, Scott. The which one on this this one? Uh, the chart. The, one the on chart. The, I just wanted to see what the maladaptive outcome was. I I had missed that. Yeah. So overextension, self-absorption. This was the stage in life where often we overspend ourselves in working longer hours than we need to, volunteering more than we need to, doing everything for our kids, kind of being that. Um, I, the phrase I know for a while was the idea of helicopter parent, where um, you're kind of hovering over, making sure everything's okay, and then it kind of moved into lawnmower parent, where not only are you hovering, you've got, you're just paving the way, you're out there with the lawnmower, making sure everything is smooth behind you, which is exhausting and not helpful the one behind. So that's that overextension. And then I think we often kind of uh, yo-yo. We, we do so much, and then we get resentful, and then we pull back, and nobody cares. And then we do much, and so it's kind of this um, back and forth that happens. <laughs> Jody, I'd love to hear, um, I think, and this is something in my own personal life too, but Many of us in this room, our identity has been and probably continues to be based on what we've done or are doing. Um, and I know identity kind of runs through that whole thing. What are some ways that we help ourselves or help our kids or our parents kind of step back from that and help them to see it really is, as Paul says, you know, the core of who you are, your being is ultimately what matters. Um, and I think for the older generations, although I'm in that older, I realize, oh, here I am, middle adulthood. I still think I'm like middle age, and I realize I'm way past yeah. that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, because it's hard for me to even play it back in my own mind of like, how do I, because success is, has been ingrained yeah. um, by the generations ahead of me. Of like, it's what you do, it's what you do. And so, like, with, even with my parents and looking at our kids... And, you know, my son who's graduating from college in, you know, nine months, who gets asked, what are you going to do? And he's like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yet, that's not really a bad answer as long as his identity is right. But what are some ways that we can even play that yeah. narrative into our mind? Yeah, that's a good question. That's part of what we, we do with the um, identity process because there's this kind of, um, so I talk in the identity process about imagining or kind of using the metaphor of a tree to think about ourselves and and the roots are kind of what keep us grounded. They're the things that we do to take care of ourselves. They're the ways that we nurture ourselves. And so I think often what we have are these false roots. And the false roots to say, I'm worthy if I'm accomplishing. I'm worthy if I'm doing well enough. Um, and sometimes these come out of early experiences, like we talked about how those beginning five are so formative that somehow maybe a significant voice in our head was, you, you'll never amount to anything, or what aren't, why aren't you busy doing something? And so we have these voices that kind of create this perpetual motion, like, okay, we must keep doing it. And so I think part of it is figuring out, I, I say we kind of can identify a false route when there's an anxiety component to it. So if my job creates so much anxiety, like, am I doing it right? Am I getting promoted? Am I making enough? The anxiety it creates a false root. The healthy root is, I love being a pastor. You know, I love working with people. When I do it out of the core of who I am because it's what I love and what, it, what nourishes and energizes me, that's a healthy thing that feeds our core versus am I doing it because I want people to think well of me or I need to be needed or I need to prove that I'm doing enough. So I think so often we have these kind of both sides of the same coin that like I, when I worked with the athletes in Pepperdine, so often they loved their sport. Why they were a D1 athlete is because they loved playing soccer or they loved running. And then they get to college and then it becomes, am I enough? Am I going to be starting? Are my coaches going to be you know, proud of me? Are my parents, is it going to be worth it all the years they put into getting me ready? And they would just fall apart because the anxiety of doing it now became performance versus I just love it. It's what I do. And so I think the more, so it's not that we aren't productive. It's not that we don't, you know, being productive is part of what, what nurtures us. 
but it's are we doing it out of the core of who we are because this is what we love and what energizes us, or are we doing it because there's somehow this void that we're trying to fill by saying, if I can just do it enough, be enough, um, then I'll feel worthy. Does that answer your question? Jody, I just had one um, kind of a comment and a question to it, and maybe you're going to um, address something about this later. <clears throat> you mentioned on here that I'll, the generations, the older generations typically say, well, this younger generation is a washout. We're all in, you know, this is the end. The thing that I keep hearing um, is it's the other way around, or, or our kids are saying the opposite. I, I hear a lot of kids, especially with climate change and things like that. So I'm sorry, you know, this is, this is the world. You, you, you guys brought, brought us into this. Yeah. And so um, I don't know if maybe later or even just now, just how do we bridge that gap? Just say, because my thought is that every, as you said, every generation says that, but does every generation hear that it's coming back um, in a similar way? Like, no, no, no. So there's this kind of finger pointing. Yeah. From do the, you feel like that was different? Did you feel like you didn't point your finger at the older generation as you were growing up? I don't remember back that far. <laughs> well, you were the one having the finger I pointed. So I know I pointed feel. to my dad. I know I pointed to my dad, but I don't know that I thought about it generationally. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember that. I mean, I think one thing I see our generation, I think ish. I mean, I feel like the generation above us with work was like we we stay in the same company for you know thirty five years until we get the gold watch or whatever for retirement. And I feel like kind of that started shifting. I think the younger generation was like, well, I'm going to do something that feels valuable and maybe I'll switch jobs. You know, I think the idea of staying forever kind of started to shift. And then I think the younger generation took it a step further. Like, well, maybe I'll just go volunteer for a while. Or maybe, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a productive job. I want to feel meaning in it. And so I feel like each part of, I think, the, the finger pointing on both sides I think, and we will kind of get into this in the next section, comes out of a little bit of this insecurity and anxiety that if they all do it this way, then does that mean I did it wrong? And if, if for the younger generation, I think they're wanting, they're moving into the period where they're wanting to generate something for their world. And so to feel good about themselves, they say, well, we're doing it better you know, we're going to take care of our planet in a way that they didn't, or we're going to, um, you know, be more inclusive than they were. And so I think part of it is to, it's hard because we feel uh, defensive or reactive when someone's like, well, you did it wrong. But I think part of it, if we can kind of put our minds back into their stage, they're trying to find something to give. They're trying to find something that's unique and valuable that they can contribute to the world. And so I think if we can kind of put aside our own feelings of defensiveness in order to say, that's awesome that you guys have, that your generation is focusing on this. And I think the more we can affirm who they are, the finger pointing isn't as needed. But when they're feeling the finger pointing of, well, why aren't you doing anything productive with your life? Well, then why aren't you? You know, I think it... it when we can, so that's what we're kind of going to move into is just how do we create these relationships that can feel mutually respectful and affirming and recognizing that we each have something to offer and we each have challenges. And so, yeah, does that answer? Mm -hmm. oh. I know you think that you could talk about it, but, uh, like we all do. Thank you. I was struck by um, your description in terms of adolescence, the 12 to 18. Mm -hmm. You were saying that they want to dis, uh, express themselves in different ways, and then we have a tendency as adults say no, that they feel like they can't trust themselves. However, as a parent or grandparent, I think that's part of our role because there are things that they try to do sometimes that are not appropriate um, to, to the culture, to the home that they're living in, mm -hmm. or to the Christian society and mm -hmm. to God. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of our role to help to mold them 
during that time period. So how do we do that and at the same time allow them to know, yes, you know, gradually you can trust yourself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's challenging because I think um, if, if we look at, at our children or our parents, they will make choices that we may not agree with. I think when God looks down at us, we make choices that he does not, you know, or that he knows is going to hurt in the long run, that he knows is not our best. And, and I think it's, it's tricky to find, and that's what we'll talk about more, is how do you create that kind of relationship that empowers someone to trust themselves? Because I often say, and I, I have people in my office a lot who've been raised in a way that they felt controlled and and the word mold I know you that's that's a tricky word because being molded we don't want someone else to mold us right we want to mold ourselves and so I know what you mean by that but even just kind of that language can in, impose something on someone and so I think often kids will you've got kind of both directions they're either going to please their parents and kind of give up their own voice to do whatever is going to make their parents happy or they're going to spite their parents, and they're going to give up their own voice to do the opposite just to show that they can. And we don't want either of those. We want them to say, what feels most congruent for you? And trusting that we, have, we all have the good in us that wants to do well. But Scripture says train up a child in the way they should go, and when they grow older, they won't depart from it. Doesn't that encourage us to... Well, to mold them towards how they so should I, be. Because sometimes they really want to do some odd things or destructive things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And sometimes they need to be corrected. Yeah, the thing about that verse that always kind of, I think I wrestled with that throughout the years of raising my kids. And I think what I really landed on as I studied that and thought about how do I apply that to my life is it says in the way they should go, not in the way we want them to go. And so I think the the job of parenthood is what's your way? What's the way you should go? And believing and trusting that if we empower this healthy, confident sense of self, they find their way and it's productive and it's not destructive. And I think the destructive is so often acting out of um, the insecurity, the inferiority, the lack of self. And so um, I think ultimately it's, it's being able to trust that if we help them find their sense of self, can that help them on their own effort make those choices rather than, because I think so often, I mean, and I saw it at Pepperdine a lot because those were Christian kids, came up doing what they, what they thought they should do and what their parents wanted them to do. And Point Loma too, we work with a lot of kids there. And then they're like, I don't, I don't believe this. Or I, I was doing this because they told me to, but it doesn't feel, it didn't come out of me. And I think it has to come out of this internal sense, this is what feels right for me. And so I think we can, we can uh, listen and um, support and encourage and ask good questions. And we'll talk about a lot of that in the next ones. How do we come around people so that we create this safe place for them to emerge themselves? So it's a, it's a tricky balance. And when we have kids in our home, obviously, yeah, there are boundaries. And we'll talk about boundaries too that There are certain things that are destructive and unsafe that we do, you know, have to help kids with. And I think it's that tension within us is what's unhealthy and unsafe versus what's not what I would hope for them. I actually just wanted to follow up on what Scott said, but... um... I kind of see it as the older generation or the generation older than us uh, being fearful of where the world is and it going, sort of everything's going to hell in a handbasket, whereas the younger people feel like um, you, you people have screwed this world up, mm-hmm. but uh, we have hope and believe and we can um, fix it or change it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I look at our generation as kind of, we're the ones sandwiched in between this fear and hope, and Mm -hmm. uh, how do we deal with that? Yeah, I think I feel like I navigate that a lot with my kids. You know, they have some 
very different political beliefs than I do, and um, yeah, and attack of that way. And I think so often it's to be able to say, but what about this? You know, that helping helping move uh, to the other side and helping them see it's not all bad and it's not all good. And I think being kind of that that mediary voice that says, yeah, maybe there are some things that they missed, but there are also some things that were great. And I think as we cultivate the relationships with, you know, I think the more my kids know my parents, they begin to appreciate different parts of who they were and what they did and how they did it. And so again, I think it's the more we can kind of create those connections that that help it to become a person. You know, I think when it's like, well, that generation versus, oh, my grandparents. You know, when it's someone that you know and you connect with and you create those um, relationships, I think with any diversity, it's easy to, to not like a certain category of people until you sit with someone and talk with them and you realize, huh, we're, we have a lot more in common than, we, than differences. So cultivating, I think, connection and helping people. I think that's kind of part of looking at all these different ages. It's like, okay, yeah, there's some things that maybe are really frustrating about that, but also do you get what they're going through inside that may be leading to some of that frustration? And same on the kit, you know, some of this weird behavior, but it's this internal struggle that they're trying to work through. And so the more we can kind of have understanding of the unique challenges, I think it can help create more respect, maybe. Children, the grandchildren, that the grandchildren should have for the grandparents, because that's the struggle of having our kids. You know, my my mom is in her 80s, and she speaks a certain way, and we try to correct her at the table, and it's just this constant. She speaks in a way that's offensive she, to yeah, the kid. Well, they they perceive it. They go, mm -hmm. well, you can't say this, you can't say that, yeah. and it's just this yeah. constant. You know, and my in-laws, it's the same. They're from a, I mean, everybody's in their late 80s. Mm -hmm. Our kids are only in their 20s. Mm -hmm. But it's just this constant, um, yeah. you can't have, it's not that you can't have conversations, but you you, you discourage the conversation because it's not worth it. Because you're constantly stepping over a line and saying the wrong every, thing and it's all going. nobody ever says the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we never say the right thing according to our kids, but then when with our parents, my thing is like that's my mom. That's how. That's your grandparents. You need to be respectful. But I'm trying to. I know, as you said, um, of quoting the Bible of the way to for our ch it's there. I, mean, I, I don't know remember, but you said it's there. Basically, yeah. it's their lives, yeah. right? And so we want to be respectful of the kids, our boys, but we want it. Keep teaching them the respect. Yeah. Yeah. Of my, our parents. Yeah, and I think that's the key. And I think um, traditionally there's the idea that you must respect your elders, and I know different cultures who, who hold to that in a stronger way. But I think the Bible talks about mutual respect. And so I think it is just as important that, that, that the grandparents really respect the kids and show that respect. And I think, again, so often we're acting out of this need to prove or to show, well, you think I'm bad, I think you're bad. And when we can really begin to help both sides respect and understand the story and value their story. And, and respect means you're kind. We'll talk about this in, in when we talk about boundaries, being kind, but we don't have to believe the same thing. Like I can listen to my kids talk about their political views. I don't agree with them. I can share how I think, but I can also say, yeah, what made you come to that idea? You know, tell me more about that. Rather than, well, it's not that way, or that's, you know, that's stupid. Or, you know, I think so often we kind of have that demeaning way between generations that fuels it on both sides. So I guess in the middle, we try to really um, model respect without having to agree. And I think that's the key part. How can we be kind and respectful even when we disagree? Sorry, I have another question. Um, so much of what we're talking about today, or well, probably all day, but this morning in particular, um, assumes maturity. <laughs> On all parts. <laughs> and 
I, yes, for all of us, I include myself. Um, because I feel like many of us are still kind of stuck in adolescence or an adolescence as you have up here, you know, now goes at least 25, 30, 40, um, 60, 60. Yeah. Um, and it is because there's so much information that comes out, whether you're social media savvy or not, whether you're watching Fox news, CNN, whatever. Um, and I, and I think it, Maybe I'll get to a question eventually here, um, <laughs> but I, I, we assume that we're we're dealing with all mature people, mm-hmm. and I think my concern is that most of us aren't super mature. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious, how do we, as we engage with kids or parents? I mean, to Shubhan and Vidar's point, I mean, it is like, you know, some of the stuff my kids say. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like. Um, and they're fairly mature kids. I'm glad they're glad they're not here. Um, but you know, but then yeah. likewise on the elder stage too, it's like, you know, it's like we all devolve into immaturity, I think very quickly, especially in this day and age. Yeah. Like, so how do we, in those conversations, like, this is probably what I'm thinking through. Like, how do I get myself to step back and say, okay, this is my kid saying this, this is my mom saying this. I want to be the peacekeeper and mm-hmm. and go more towards like, can we have a mature conversation? Yeah. Agree to disagree because yeah. this is very hard in culture. Yeah. Um, very long way of asking, what do we? How do we help our? I guess particularly for those of us in the room, um, what do we? How do we step back and be the mm-hmm. mature voice? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we'll get into in the next the next session. And you're right. I almost when I was talking with my husband about what should I call this last stage, and we were talking about maturity. And I'm like, well. They're not necessarily mature <laughs> just because just because we reach a certain age doesn't make us mature at, at any stage. And I feel like in some ways my kids are are more mature than me in certain ways. And and I think that idea, like when you said, you know, often my parents will say something and I'll say, you, you just can't say it that way, Dad. That's hurtful. And it's okay. You know, I rather than being like, well, that's so racist or whatever, you know, I can just say that's really hurtful and have a conversation like, because I think so often they say it unintentionally. You know, it's just their culture is different. They grew up talking different ways. And so I think to be able to not accept that, because it, it is hurtful. And there are a lot of ways that the younger generation and the inclusivity incl- inclusivity, and um, diversity, that they're teaching us important ways about embracing people for who they are. And so I think finding ways that we can help help the others see it like I think exactly like you said um, finding that maturity in us and non kind of quieting our own reactivity um, so that we can have those conversations and again we'll talk about next time it comes out of our own discomfort our own insecurity um, our own need to be right and so the more we can kind of be unoffendable we can enter into those relationships I think in a healthier way that's a great word, undefendable. <clears throat> One more question, maybe? Okay. So would you say when we get to, let's say, the older adulthood or sage old age, when we're trying to revisit and reintegrate, that that's really, in, in, in one sense, a, a crisis of looking once again, are we good enough and who am I and all that sort of stuff. And so having the a positive conversation uh, and really being intentional about that and working on that uh, with those that are different than us, say our kids or whoever it might be, will not only be beneficial for our relationship with them, but will help us through this process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think with our kid, helping our kids understand this is a challenging stage that our your grandparents are going through. Their Their world is different, their self is different. And yeah, so how do we kind of help them navigate it? And in that, we're, we're showing them, we're telling ourselves and we're showing our kids, how do we grow old gracefully, which I think is the goal of all of, all of us. Can I just... Okay, yeah, I just, uh, I just make a comment that I, I think, hopefully the rest of you have, do not have this problem, but with uh, bigger families and all spread out and just, you know, COVID hit and travel, it, it does feel extra isolating. Mm-hmm. And then you go to try to reach out to your grandkids and it's, it's 
impossible to find a time where you can even get one of them on a conversation and then they're rushing off. So, you know, it's kind of, I have this sensation we want to give them the wisdom. We'd love to tell them the stories and have time to engage them on our ancestry and things like that, that I believe someday they'll wish they had those conversations with us. Mm -hmm. And how do we create any mm -hmm. space for that? Mm -hmm. It's, I do feel incredibly, and I don't want to say sorry, but the challenge for the parents today, I don't even know if I could do it with the high tech and the busyness. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a different world. And maybe well, every generation says that. But you know, I would say, I mean, I think your desire to do that, and that's part of that generativity, like what do I have to give back to my world? It may be that your kids don't have the hours to sit and listen to your stories, but maybe you can record yourself. Maybe you can start to journal. My dad did a kind of his own memoirs or whatever. And, and I love that because we'll want to read it someday, but we, we don't have time. And I think when often when um, parents or grandparents reach out to their kids, it's different if it's like I need to tell them something or advise them of something versus I want to just know how are you. You know, and I, we had a, my grandfather, uh, my father-in-law, reached out to my son, wrote a letter. First time he's ever written a letter, and it was his need to correct my son on something. And it, it, was, it broke the relationships within the whole family because the siblings were like, how dare you? And for my son to feel like that's the first letter I've ever gotten from grandpa and that's what he chose to do with that, you know? And so I think that idea, like maybe we can't talk to him on the phone or get a text, but maybe we just, you know, send, they still like getting letters, you know, they don't, they don't do that. And so to just send a card that says, hey, I'm thinking about you. I love you. How are you? Or, you know, I just think those are the ways to keep the connection that isn't imposing on them. It's just showing up and being present in their lives.